Hello, everyone. How's it going? So we're here today to uh, talk a little bit about Aero, uh, what it is, uh, what you can do with it, uh, and a little bit about uh, Kotlin. And before we get started, I'd like to ask you guys, uh, how many here is a Scala developer or familiar with Scala? All right. How about Haskell? OK. Kotlin. All right, a few of them. So, um, First, uh, I'm Raul, uh, I'm CTO at 47 Degrees. Uh, we're part of the organization uh, of this conference and we're a consultancy. We do functional programming, that's our specialty. And we mostly target uh, Scala, Swift, and the Kotlin programming uh, languages. And Aero, as a library, started uh, as a simple exercise where a bunch of folks from the Spanish Android community wanted to learn about functional programming and how they could apply functional programming techniques to Android development. So at that time, uh, Google had not announced yet that Kotlin was going to be the official uh, language uh, for Android development. But uh, I think it was probably uh, almost a year ago, uh, they announced that Kotlin was going to be the de facto programming language, and therefore all mobile consultancies uh, that are doing today Java, most of them are migrating uh, to Kotlin because of this announcement. And this is part of the race of Kotlin that you guys may have seen online and why so many people uh, talk about Kotlin. So we started with something very basic and we just basically encoded the option data type in a couple of functional data types and then showed people how to use them. People got excited and by the time uh, we realized we had a full-fledged uh, functional programming library similar in a scope to what you find in Scala such as uh, type level cuts or a Scala set, that kind of a scope, type classes, data types, and so on. We're going to see a, a few of them in a second. And I personally didn't want in the Kotlin community to happen the same we had in Scala, where because of community issues, the functional programming community is divided into Scala Z and, and cuts or type level in the type level ecosystem. So at that time, when we have a category, which was the previous name, we decided to fusion with Functionale, which was the other uh, functional programming library at the time. Uh, we talked to Mario, who was maintaining it, and he agreed that the best for the Kotlin community was going to be if we join forces and create a single uh, solution for type functional programming that included not only the basic type classes and, and core data types, but also a bunch of other side libraries such as recursion schemes, uh, optics, and so on. So today in Aero, you can find all kinds of uh, type classes. We have uh, an effects library. So what you would see in other uh, libraries like cats, like you know, monad error, applicative error, all the functional type classes are encoded uh, in Kotlin as well. And we also have like an MTL library and optics, and as I mentioned earlier, recursion schemes that provide further type classes and, and data types. As far as like data types, uh, we have uh, the usuals uh, that you can find, such as option, try, when you're working with uh, concrete data types, but also we have a whole suite of uh, transformers and data types that are in the JVM oriented for uh, evaluation uh, style strategies. So to get you guys like acquainted with Kotlin and how it feels uh, to program with Aero, I thought that we could just like walk through a very simple example it's going to be just implementing one function, and we're going to call that a library. But this function is going to do a lot of uh, cool stuff. So these are our requirements uh, to be completed today. We need to fetch uh, gist information from GitHub for a given uh, GitHub username. And we want to provide in our library an immutable model. We want that model to be pleasant to work with uh, for our users. And we want to be able to support not just like you see in most uh, Java libraries where uh, the actual library is tied to a particular data type, for example, completable future, or Kotlin core routines, or any actual concrete data type. So we want this to be abstract enough such as that we can support a bunch of different uh, data types that are popular in the Kotlin ecosystem. And some of them are, if you guys are familiar with uh, Rx2 or Rx Java. Anyone knows it? Okay. So observable is one of them that is very popular in Android uh, development. 
uh, Flux, if you guys are familiar with uh, the Reactor uh, Spring Framework for backend development as well. Flux is another popular data type. Defer comes from Kotlin coroutines. So uh, Kotlin has a coroutines library, which I'm gonna show a little bit about it in a second. And they use the deferred data type, and that's uh, similar in uh, scope as to what, what you will have in uh, Scala as a future or a promise. And then finally, Aero as a solution for tight functional programming offers an IO data type that is like proper IO, which you know, has power to do concurrency, asynchronous uh, computations, and, and so on. And finally, we want our library to remain uh, pure, meaning let the user actually perform the evaluation of the effects that our library is uh, producing in internally. Any questions so far? Okay. So in a gist, uh, it could be expressed as we're gonna get, get a username and then return a list of gist, and we're gonna work around this concept. So if you're not familiar with type FP or some of the concepts that I'm gonna explain, feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions interrupt any time, we can go over them. So the first thing we wanna do is provide an immutable model. And we want working with that model to be something pleasant to, to our users when we're designing a library. Kotlin has a similar to Scala, if you guys are familiar with uh, case classes, Kotlin has the data uh, modifier to the node that this is a class with just you know, data. There's uh, potentially no behavior attached, though you can of course, add functions in the scope, and um, and it's a and we're trying here to come with a model where we're completely separating, you know, the actual definition of data from the definition of the behaviors that it's going to act over that data, the functions. So here we just have simply a gist. We trim down all the properties from GitHub that were not interesting for for this. So uh, the actual model is much larger than this, but we can see two things in this model. There's two properties, one is uh, files and the other is owner. And those properties are actually auto model classes. They're nested, right? And how will we construct a, a model? Well, we can construct it in memory like this, and of course, if we're using the GitHub API, it'll come after JSON serialization. But this is what we're gonna work with so far. So Kotlin, in the same way as a Scala does, uh, whenever you define a data class, it provides a synthetic copy method. That method is injected by the compiler, and it also gives you an implementation for free of equals uh, and has code. So you can treat them as if you're using Java or any other uh, language that uses the concept of Java beans or data classes in this way. Uh, they're uh, directly compatible. And copy is fine. It's fine when we are just like modifying uh, certain parts of our model that are kind of like in the top of the hierarchy. If we can see here, if we wanna just like change the description of the model because it's immutable, of course we cannot just say gist.description equal whatever. We have to instead use copy and then we have to call into description. In this case, the question mark that you see here is because Kotlin has the concept of nullable types, so it has the, the, the option monad built in in the language with the actual syntax for you to not uh, cause null pointer exceptions as you're dealing with uh, access to those uh, values. And this is fairly simple, and the reason it's simple is because it's, uh, we're changing description on the top of the hierarchy of gist. Now it gets more complicated as we have to like dig uh, deep into the model, and then we have to change other properties. Like in this uh, particular case, we're just trying to uppercase uh, the login name for presentation purposes, and we see that we have to call copy twice, and if we had even more nested uh, models, the, ne the times that we had to do copy, 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 increases. So this actually is pretty obnoxious for, for users, and it's one of the reasons why people don't favor immutable uh, data types sometimes in languages like Kotlin or Java and so on. Arrow provides an optics library, and with optics you can create uh, lenses. Who's familiar with lenses or the concept of optics? Okay, so lenses are nothing but a way to define a getter and a setter to access the value and then set the value. So we can see here in the example that we have a lens for honor 
in a lens for logging, and we can just define how you actually get to that property from a gist, or how you get to that property from a GitHub user. Once we have those lenses, the nice thing about lenses that copy doesn't bring you is that lenses are composable. So we can easily create complex transformations that access uh, deeply down the nested model that we are working with. So this is nice, because uh, if you're into creating all this uh, boilerplate for you, uh, you can create very complex workflows, as mentioned, but it's not uh, ideal either for a community like the Kotlin community. Like people want, uh, you know, faster and simpler access to some of these things, and not necessarily everyone is acquainted with functional programming in, in Kotlin. So the philosophy that Arrow is following is attempt to provide always a friendly API for developers that are not into functional programming or having bridged that gap yet, but they can still use, right? So how, what does uh, Arrow provide to make immutability access super easy? Uh, we provide an optics library. So the only thing you need to do is uh, annotate your data classes or your sealed classes, like in Scala we have the concept of sealed classes for some types and co-product types. Just annotate them with optics and Arrow will automatically generate for you this nice DSO that is projected over the companion object. So the Arrow Optics DSO projects over the companion object lenses that are immediately composed with each other in the same syntax that you would ha had if you were accessing that with mutability to change a given uh, property for arbitrarily nested data types and also supports collections, uh, maps, and uh, other types of uh, you know, optics that, that are required for elements that are multiple versus single style um, properties. Any questions so far? Please. I'm just trying to read the syntax. It looks like when you add the at, uh, optics annotation to the gist, it's adding code to the owner? Yes, yeah, so basically, in Kotlin, in Kotlin, we have a data class here. And if you guys see the companion object that is declared there, that's an optional declaration. But companion objects are embedded inside the actual class that declared them. So, when, so that companion object is basically where you will place a static or functions or methods that don't necessarily access the instance scope. Instead of accessing the instance scope, uh, it's accessing just like a, whatever you pass on as arguments. So here what's happened is that whenever we declare optics in that companion object, we project all of the properties, all of, of the data class, but the, the lens version of those properties. So we generate all of those lenses for you automatically. We also generate prisms and add instances and the different type classes involved in optics for all of the different data types that you've declared on the data class. That gives you direct access, such as that you can just say gist owner login modify with this gist, and then apply uh, this function. And it gives you back a copy of the entire immutable uh, model transform. So it's, it's changing, it's adding companion objects, not just gist, but also to a bunch of other sub -type, or sorry, field types you might not have access to change, right? Yes, and the way it does that is through extension functions, which uh, I'm going to explain in, in a little bit. But basically, in Kotlin, Declaring extensions functions over a type is much easier than Scala. You don't require an implicit class or the implicit mechanism because it's built in syntactically in the language. You can just say string, do whatever, and that's an extension function over string that is not directly in the scope of the class definition. It's, you know, you import it and you use it, like we do with type classes, basically. So we've provided an immutable model it allows easy memory updates uh, and support deeply nested relationships that are arbitrary, and we don't have to declare any boilerplate to do modifications of the immutable data to actually access to those. So the next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to come up with an initial impure implementation that blocks and throws, which are things that we don't want in our library. But we're going to kind of like evolve this implementation into something that is purely functional. In this implementation, you can see that uh, we are performing an HTTP GET, and it's, uh, we're getting the response as a string. So that's actually going to block, right? Because uh, if we are doing I.O. and we're not like, encapsulating our return type into something like deferred or future or I.O., 
uh, we're always going to have a, a blogging thread there waiting for the response to come back. And the other thing we're doing is like we're throwing exceptions. If the result uh, returned uh, and it's an exception, we're just going to throw it. And then this is going to blow the stack, and that's not good. But that's, this is actually how most, uh, you know, many Java libraries are implemented. And um, you can see here some of the features of Kotlin, like uh, in the particular case of a response string, that returns a triple, which is like a tuple of three. And you can destructure that into the different components in the same way you can do in Scala. You can also see here a, a small example of pattern matching, which is not as powerful as a Scala's. It uses the when uh, block. And you can match on a value and then provide a set of different patterns, like if it's of this type, or if it's of this kind of a Boolean expression, and so on. So we have uh, completed the first requirement. We can now fetch the gist, but this is still uh, blocking and definitely not pure, since it's uh, throwing uh, exceptions. So something very common when people are learning functional programming, it's a uh, you don't usually learn type classes or abstractions first. You usually learn basic data types that you can play with in your code. And those are usually option, either, uh, try, and so on. Those kind of data types are great because they allow us to have finer control over error handling or some of absence of values. And we can see here how we're using either to get rid of the exception throwing, and we're just returning left or right. Uh, error provides not only data types, but also syntax over all of the different types that you have uh, in your program. In this case, uh, left is a syntax over for any A. Uh, you can like lift it into the left context of either and write the same way. So we have the same kind of syntax for option and all the different data types, much in the same way as you would find uh, in cats, but without the, re the requirement of having implicits in the scope. So now we have, uh, it's somewhat pure because it never th throws ex exceptions, but the problem of those data types using either an option directly in your code is that for one, they cannot really defer uh, effect evaluation because even if you instantiate a try or a neither, the effect is gonna run before you place it into the actual context unless you use a combinator that it's uh, lazy. So those, uh, this, uh, either doesn't solve the problem of this uh, continue being a, a blocking operation and uh, executing the effects. If we call public gist for user, this whole thing is going to start running. We don't want that to run. We want that to uh, be holding memory or whatever until the user is ready to say, here's my edge of the wall. I'm going to unsafe perform IO this whole thing. So a very popular framework in Kotlin is uh, coroutines. Is anyone familiar with coroutines in Kotlin or coroutines in general? OK. So coroutines in Kotlin, it's a framework that um, contains a few data types that are very interesting, like the fern. The fern is very similar to Scala's uh, feature, but it has uh, the option to do both eager and lazy evaluation strategies. So the fur is actually a suitable data type for effect suspension. You can think of it as uh, the most popular IO-like data type in Kotlin world right now, and that's because of uh, Kotlin coroutines. So here, the only thing we're doing to encapsulate this entire computation and making it a sync is just using the async keyword. The async keyword is not a keyword. It's an actual function on the coroutines library inside experimental. And it basically just takes an entire block and it defers and makes the computation asynchronous. So we can see here in this example, uh, what I mentioned earlier, when we actually invoke this entire thing as sync, the coroutine is already active. That means that it already started executing. That feature started running, and we already contacted the GitHub API, and we already got the results, no matter if that was a sync or not. It just happened. So we are supporting the fair, which was one of the popular data types that we wanted to support, but we still have uh, many more to go. And then we still have the problem that effects are running uh, right away. So how can we make this more functional? 
one of the problems we have when people are using um, things like defer or effects like either or option, which are very popular, is like you start with uh, option, then you realize you're blocking. So you start with defer of either of whatever. And as we go down that rabbit hole, uh, we are ending up with like a bunch of nested effects that we need to inspect and then unfold every single time to get to the value that we care about. In this particular case, uh, there is something you guys may be wondering, is like, where, where did the fair go, right? The return type of this function is no longer asynchronous. That's not the case. This is actually what suspend is doing right here. So this is part of the coroutine system. And a suspended function is a function that gives the parameter control, such as that you can perform asynchronous computations or any kind of contextual computations, and then gel control back to the system at a point where you are ready with the value that you have. So therefore, the return types don't need to be the fair of list of whatever. They can be just list if the function is suspended. So in this particular case, we're saying public gist for user. We're calling the GitHub API, and we need to do some composition here to sum the gist of a user with the ones from another user. And we can see that we are calling a wait. And a wait is also a suspended function. So if this function returns a deferred of A, a wait is going to give us an A, but it's not going to block the thread. It's going to use the coroutine fiber and green thread system underneath to perform most, or the, all those competitions without actually uh, blocking. And this eliminates the need for actually having a synchrony as a declare effect on the type system. Do you need to do that inside the suspend, suspend type function? Exactly. So if I were to remove suspend from the modifier list in this function, a wait will not compile because a wait is also a suspended function. So that's the way they basically control that nobody's blocking until you actually get, say, OK, I want the results in either in a sync way or a sync way. And there is where you actually block. But you, we don't have to deal with uh, mono transformers. We don't have to deal with, even with uh, concrete data types. And we're going to see that uh, in a little bit. In whatever case, if we're using uh, this kind of computation where we see each other inspecting the nested effects all the time, uh, that's going to be like super hard for developers to get used to in your team if they're not acquainted with functional programming. And they're going to say, why don't we just like throw exceptions and return the value that we care for? Right. So Arrow provides uh, monad transformers as well. So the same way you have uh, either T or option T or any other ones when you have either nested effect or the option nested effect over any uh, type constructor, Arrow provides that as well. You can see here a little bit of a crazy syntax, which I'm going to explain in a second. <clears throat> so basically, because we, we don't have a implicit when we create type classes, we project the type class instances into the companion of the data types that are providing the instance for the type class. So in this case here, we see that we can access uh, monad in either T, so the monad instance of either T. And we're using for the fair K. And the fair K for the fair K here is going to be the higher kind of representation of the fair. The reason why we use that is because Kotlin does not have support for higher kind of types. So instead of using higher kind of types, we have an emulation for higher kind of types because higher kind of types can be emulated in type systems that do not support them if they support uh, simple uh, generics. And I'm going to show you guys uh, how that's done in a second. But we do uh, plan to provide a proposal to improve the coding programming language uh, with higher kind of types in the same way we already have one for type classes, which eliminates all of the boilerplate of uh, type class generation. So now we have, uh, we are supporting the fair. We are allowing easy access to the nested effects because with transformer it's much easier. You can just flat map straight through the value that you care about. You don't have to worry about unpacking all those nested uh, either's and options or whatever they are. But we still need to support observable flags and I.O. And if we don't support that, like, you can be as functional as you want. But at the end of the day, you have users and you have a community to support. And those are the types that that community uses. And this is where Arrow is strong. Arrow is strong because it's the single 
uh, library that at the moment allows you to do uh, polymorphism for type functional programming in this style. So we don't need concrete data types. We're going to use type classes. We're going to use uh, polymorphism. And uh, this is what a type class looks like in Kotlin. So it's just a plain old interface like we have in Java. We have some methods on the interface. This actually would be more of like what a tagless final encoded type class uh, would look like. So the weird thing you see here is that because there is no support for higher kind of types, you don't see an f of list k of gist. Instead, you see a kind of f where the second type argument is the actual return value. But having those two type arguments is the same as saying f of list k of uh, gist. So at the end of the day, the lack of support for higher kind of types, not that big of a deal except for a little more verbose uh, types. And this is how it works. This is how higher kind of polymorphism works in, in Kotlin. There's no more to it than this. You, if you have a class, and this is based on, on a paper, Lightweight Higher Kind of Polymorphism by Jeremy Jallop and Leo White, uh, it's done for OCaml, but it can be applied for any other languages where the type system doesn't have higher kind of types. And basically what you do is, first, you declare your data type. And uh, your data type has to stand uh, kind of a marker of the value. And by that subtype relationship, we know that when we're in higher kind of, kind of polymorphism grounds, we can always go back to concreteness by calling a fix and downcasting, safe downcasting the, the kinded version to the mono version of the type. That's all it takes. And, uh, and with this, you can write polymorphic programs in Kotlin pretty easily. We're going to see a, a little bit of that. <clears throat> so ca how can we implement this computation if we don't know uh, what f is, right? So we can use type classes. This is what a type class, a proper uh, type, a functional programming type class that we use looks like in Kotlin. There's a couple of nice things. Uh, here we see the, the syntax I mentioned earlier for extension functions. You can see that I can map directly over the value for any kind of f and a. That is the same as if I was calling map in list, option, try, either, directly. In Kotlin, we don't really get into the, the game of defining static functions for the type classes and then syntax added to the type classes like we do in Scala. It's more of a direct thing. It's just we just define extensions. And that's how the type classes uh, behave with uh, fewer uh, boilerplate when you're coding. And then we have, of course, the static functions that are not scoped to the type they extend, but they're just like lifting values into the context of the, the functor, in this case, the functor of f. So as you can see, syntax is fairly similar uh, to a Scala, except for the way generics don't use like you know, square brackets. But other than that, it's uh, pretty much the same. So we have a bunch of type classes in, in Arrow. We have a semigroup, mono, it's a, all the functor hierarchy complete all, all the way up until uh, effect, and as I mentioned earlier, MTO type classes. If you're familiar with uh, cat's effect, uh, some of the type classes here, like a sync or effect, are going to be familiar to you. Uh, if you know what sync in cat's effect is, we call that uh, monad defer. And the reason we do that is because the Kotlin community frequently associates the word sync with a synchronous blocking code, which is not necessarily related to the purpose of, of the type class. So we're trying also to disambiguate some of the, the names so people don't get confused to what they're already used to. So how can we make this entire theme polymorphic? We can do it this way. This is an actual taxless final interpreter implementation of the interface uh, that we've declared earlier. And it uses the async type class. So in Scala, if you were to encode this, you will have a async as an implicit uh, argument to either the class or, or the function. Kotlin has something really nice, which it's called uh, delegation. And delegation in Kotlin uh, has no boilerplate. So you can see here that the constructor takes the async uh, instance, but then the actual implementation makes itself extend async by the delegated property which means that all of the extension functions 
declaring a sync and an entire function hierarchy are available in the scope of this class. And this allows us to do things like you know, map, flat map, and a bunch of other uh, different things with uh, the actual methods directly over the types. Any questions? I should have asked this several slides ago, because it's not exactly amazing. I've noticed every time that you're uh, unpacking either, you're testing Boolean like result.failure instead of pattern matching on the failures. Right. So the question is, uh, why are we? It was on that slide you're on, too. You Sorry. So the question is, why are we testing booleans instead of pattern matching? Because Kotlin doesn't support pattern matching. So the pattern matching in Kotlin is so reduced that there is so very few things you can do uh, with it. There is no concept of apply or an apply, like in Scala. And therefore, you cannot pattern match against a tuple of options or values or anything like that. Now, can it be built? Definitely. But I think because there is uh, initiatives in, the, in Java land to do proper pattern matching in Java as well. They're kind of waiting there to see what, what happens and see where they go with that. That's why we're testing Booleans. But I mean, uh, the, I'm testing Boolean here because result is not the type that I wrote. Should, I, should that have been the type I wrote, this would have been on the foldable hierarchy and I would have folded over those values instead of like inspecting them manually like I'm doing here. So yeah, so basically here I think gives us a combinator uh, which we're using, and the combinator has a function that uh, we have to invoke. And this is actually the type class that we use to integrate with third-party APIs that are asynchronous and probably sometimes not even well-behaved. Like, they might throw exceptions. So we always have to contemplate, here's uh, this function that has an either. Once you run it, if, uh, if it's a good value, then we have to lift it and then invoke it so that we take the asynchronous computation back into the context of f, which we don't know yet what that is, right? And that's why we had to use type classes. So I think one of the type classes. Because we don't have implicits, we don't wire things implicitly, uh, we don't use implicits for dependency injection. So, but at the end of the day, for in my experience, it's as easy as you have a module or a place where you declare you know, your instances and how you want them to behave, whether you want them to be singleton or or prototype style construction, and then you just run with that and make concrete at the edge. And this still works great if you are in polymorphic land. There's no, no major boilerplate but this. So here we are basically saying, my library has all these uh, classes and uh, components. Some of them are private. Here's my public one, the API. And that's the one that is going to expose to the external world. So once we have our entire library defined in terms of type classes and polymorphic in, in terms of f, the only thing we have to do is uh, make it concrete at the edge. So in this case, if we were creating a library that wanted to support all of those different data types, we're not going to make the mistake of putting them all in the same compilation unit and include all those dependencies. So we're going to have this in separate uh, libraries, separate jars. And the only thing they need to be doing is uh, make concrete their entire polymorphic computation to the actual data type that they want to support. In this case, they're supporting deferred. And you can tell now that the coroutine that is powering the runtime behind the scenes is actually lazy, because Arrow, whenever it integrates a framework like Kotlin coroutines of Rx, Java, or any of those, it always tries to use, it, use the combinators and and APIs that are going to allow us to suspend the effects so that they don't get executed immediately. So in the same way we declare one for Kotlin coroutines, we can do the same for Flux, the entire. And the reason why this is working is because we have an instance of a sync for Flux. It's that easy. And we can do the same for I.O., which we also, of course, provide all the instances for I.O. Uh, inside of Arrow. And finally, for Rx2, for observables, we can also do the same thing. We also have, like in the case of observable, uh, flat mapping through an observable in libraries that sometimes have like different strategy. They have like concat map and so many others uh, ways to like hint at the runtime that you want. You have this kind of a scenario. So we have different monad instances also for the different monad capable data types that. Um, 
that RX2 uh, supports as well. So we ended up being able to fulfill all our requirements. We did it using ad hoc polymorphism. Even though Golding did not support natively higher kind of types or does not support natively the concept of type classes, the other constructs that Golding has in the language uh, makes all of this uh, fairly easy to implement. And I would say, in many cases, much simpler than if you were relying on a, on a universal implicit style system where you know, everything is modeled with implicit syntax, uh, type classes, implicit conversions, and, and so on. So we had a functional requirement which was fetching the JS. Uh, we solved the immutable model problem using the optics library. We support all of those different data types thanks to polymorphism and higher kind of emulation that Aero provides. And now we can do also effect control because all of those data types have been implemented. Uh, the instances in such a way that they don't run immediately. So they behave in much uh, the same way that IO would in Haskell or in Scala. And Arrow is also modular. So Arrow is not a library like Scala Z that has like a million of classes and type classes all in one place because the Kotlin uh, community does not care about a single solution for type functional programming. What they care more is uh, I'm going to use this data type, I'm going to use this kind of functionality that I care for, or I want to use this for the, this DSL. So we're attempting to pack all of these functionalities in multiple modules that they can be uh, used individually. And this is also important because uh, in Android, uh, byte code size uh, matters. So it's, uh, this is also targeting some of the Android community. What we did not cover in this talk, so we have uh, do notation in Kotlin. Um, it's like for comprehension in Scala. Uh, and it uses the coroutine system. So in the same way, you could say await before to actually suspend a future computation. You can say bind. And basically, you are delegating to flat map for any arbitrary uh, monad. Therefore, you can use the same syntax for all monads. You can for comprehend or do notation over them pretty easily. We also have. Uh, the equivalent of the Cartesian builder, or think about it like you can map regardless of RIT, preserving type information. So if we have, say, uh, I don't know, 10 future computations of uh, 10 different types that return one an int, one a string, one a user, whatever, we can place them all in map, and it gives, gives us back the results once all of the computations have completed. That also works for all applicative instances, not just uh, features in asynchrony, but every applicative instance for every data type. And also we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is a keep. It's called keep87. There's a pull request. Keep is the improvement process for the Kotlin programming language. And we have a keep that adds native support to type classes in Kotlin as extension methods, much in the same way as it works in Swift, or in the same way as it's, as it's proposed in Scala in the latest uh, proposal by Martin and Luca that was published a couple of days ago. And finally, Arrow is inspiring a bunch of uh, different libraries from different uh, languages that we want to acknowledge. It's heavily inspired uh, in CATS and, and Scala set. Those are the two big ones. And it borrows from many others, like Monocle for Optics and, and all the different functionalities that, that we provide. So we invite everyone, if you like what you're seeing and you ever do any Kotlin uh, programming, uh, we're an open community. Uh, we have a Slack. Uh, this Slack actually is the entire Slack for the entire Kotlin community. JetBrain has everyone, like, I think it's close to 20,000 or 30,000 people in a single Slack instance where you have all the different channels for the libraries and discussion among other topics. So it's fun to join if uh, you're interested in Kotlin. And we also, of course, we have a, a Gitter room. We provide mentoring. So if you are new to functional programming, uh, it's not important to us. Just come, say that you like to do some work, or you want to learn some part. And we'll figure out some entry level uh, tickets and mentor you through the process of contributing uh, to the library. And finally, thank you, everyone, that made uh, this possible. And that's all I have.